What's up, everybody? How's it going to be in the house today? Man, get excited. Let's give Jesus the praise. <laughs> Mission-minded. We're starting a brand new series of messages, and I, I want to I start this off by, by giving you a quote by someone who's pretty well known in history. And this guy said, I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. He says that Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I have founded empires, but on what did we rest the creation of our genius upon force? And even this, in this moment in history, we're watching a world leader try to take his territory by what? By force. But look at what Jesus did. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love, and at this very hour, millions of men would die for him. That's Napoleon. Napoleon. So think about the mission of God, the mission of Jesus. And as we walk through this particular experience today, as we start this series of messages, I want you to lean in to what the mission of Jesus is and what the mission of the church is. Here's the mission of Jesus. The mission of Jesus is, he says in Matthew 16, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's like having a nation that's trying to be overtook by the kingdom of darkness, by evil. The, the Bible says that there is an enemy of our souls, and he's trying to take territory in your life. He's trying to take territory in your family. He's trying to take territory in your workplace. But Jesus said that he came to build his church, and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. He also said this. This is the mission of Jesus. Jesus, it says, for the Son of Man, that's Jesus, came to seek and to save those who are lost. Jesus came on a rescue mission from heaven. He came from his throne in heaven. He's the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And he left, and he left paradise. Why? To rescue you. And to rescue all of humanity. Which begs the question, right, if, if Jesus had this mission, if, if Jesus was on this op from God, why did he have this particular mission? I'm glad you asked that question. Why is this op necessary? Romans 6 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's stay here for just a second. For the wages of sin is death. In other words, when you sin... When I sin, when anyone sins, it separates us from a holy, perfect, righteous God. Sin causes a separation, a spiritual death, a physical death. And I don't know if you know this or not, but the statistics on sin leading to death is a 100% casualty rate. Like if you think about this for a second, can right, cancer has a mortality rate. We think about heart disease, and heart disease is at the top, accidents, pand the pandemic having a casualty rate. But all of that came into existence because of sin. Sin caused death. And what does that lead to? It leads to us needing the free gift of God, which is given to us eternal life only in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let me put it another way. I like this in Romans chapter 3. It says, as there is written, because some of you may, may be like, well, I'm not as bad as Hitler. I'm not as bad as Putin. But the scriptures say, there is no one who is righteous. No, not one. And think about that for a second. That in this time period in, in human history, the atrocities that are, that are being, being shown to us before our very eyes, this, this evil that's come in and trying to take over a nation, and taking out civilians, taking out innocent people, kids and, and families. And, and yet the mission of Jesus is to rescue humanity, what? From our very selves, from our, from our own evil that's within us, our own sin. No one is righteous, not even one. But Jesus didn't just leave us there. He did something about it. He took on the operation from God the Father, the mission. 
Think about this for just a second. That God the Father so loved humanity, so loved you and me, that he was willing to sacrifice his one and only son, that you would not perish, not take on the penalty of your sin, but that you would be able to receive eternal life. And Jesus in return gladly accepted the operation. He gladly accepted the mission on your behalf. And can I tell you something? I don't know about you, but I know about me. There's not a lot of people on planet Earth that are lining up to die for me. That's good news. That, that might be a place to clap. Thank you, Jeff. And I promise if you respond to my preaching, I'm gonna preach it better and quicker. Let's go. I'm fired up today, I'm already sweating, and so I'm already gonna, yeah, I gotta shed some layers here. <laughs> so what happens? First John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, man, so many of us have this protective nature. In the very beginning, when, when, when Adam and Eve sinned, the first thing they did was they did, they ran and hide, and they ran and hid, and they tried to cover themselves. We're still doing that today. When we lie, when we, when we take things out on our spouses or our kids, when we do something that's sinful, what do we do? We try to cover it up. We try to hide it. And Jesus is telling us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and then to, con to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So check this out. You sin. Some of it might be that little white lie. Some of it might be the tone in which you talked to your kids. Some of it might be the tone in which you talked to your mom and dad. <laughs> Seeing you students, you're not off the hook. But man, we got to check ourselves. We got to check our heart before God and let God transform us. And here's the deal. When we sin, instead of covering it up, when we confess it, he is faithful and just to forgive it. And here's the beautiful part. When he sins, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So there's no guilt, no shame. There's no father in heaven going, get it together. Oh my goodness, you sick sinner, slum dog, gross, dirty, blah. Here's the sound of the Father when it relates to you confessing your sins. It's the sound of if it never existed. It's the sound of it's been forgotten. It's the sound of it's been forgiven. And for the life of me, we need a people who say, man, I'm going to confess. I'm going to open up my life. And where there is weakness, God says there is strength. We confess our sins to the Lord, and he is faithful and just to forgive it. Can I get an amen? Let's be this kind of people. He goes on further. It says, if you declare, check this out, if we declare with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus will raise you from the dead. You will have eternal life. And it starts now. Jesus says he came to give life and life abundantly. Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. So if you're living in a life of destruction and chaos and, and, and all sorts of fear and, and, and all these things, man, maybe you need to exchange that life for the life of Jesus, the life of abundance. And it starts right here and right now. And he goes on. It says, for everyone. Notice it says, for everyone. Some of you think, man, that person, they're too far gone. My coworker, that business partner, man, that person who really wronged me, who, who, who cheated on me, whatever they did, that person's too far gone. Let me take it this way. Putin is too far gone. And I want to believe that's true. But in Jesus' economy, if he repents and turns to the Lord and his heart is changed, we'll see a nation saved and we'll see Putin saved. Now, let, let me make it clear, I doubt that's going to happen, but I'll pray that that happens. And not just for his benefit, for, but for the benefit of the world. That Jesus is the only one who can change the human heart. Legislation can't do that. Government doesn't do that. Schools don't do that. Hospitals don't do that. It's the church of Jesus Christ. And Jesus came to build his church. But he goes on, he says, but how can they 
call on Jesus to save them unless they believe in him. And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? Man, so we've got to be mission-minded people of Christ. And how can they hear about him unless someone, his church, his followers, his disciples, those who are saved and are, are being uh, difference makers, eternal. Man, we're going to be bringers of people. Man, we're not saying, hey, we're, we're accusing you because you're wrong and you're filthy and you got, you're messed up. No, we're bringing people to Jesus to be saved and transformed. But we've got to do it together. We are better together. It's just not just my job, and I'm going to show you this in a minute. It's our job. If you are a follower of Christ, this is your mission from God, from Jesus to you. But here's the problem. We have too many Christians who have voluntarily gone on inactive duty. Like you've thought about church, and, and, and it's not your fault for a lot of you. A lot of you were trained to be this way. You grew up in a church where you just came to church. But the problem is church isn't a building and, and just a, a worship space. Church is a people, and we are difference makers, not just for today, but in all through he, eternity. Here's the deal. The church of Jesus Christ is Jesus' mission, Jesus' people to fulfill his promises on the earth. There's no plan B. So if we stay in active duty and we sit back and we just take up a seat in worship and maybe at home we realize that, man, man, the world is getting dark and it's, it's, it's going to hell in a handbasket and, and, man, there's so much crazy going on in the world. Well, I would argue, where are the Christians? We're to be light in the darkness. We're to be hope to the hopeless. We're to welcome people in and make them feel wanted and known. Why? Because Jesus wants them welcomed, wanted, known, saved, forgiven, set free, and to get a purpose that goes beyond just making a little money, having a little fun, paying taxes, and checking out. It goes further. So how can they hear about Jesus unless someone tells them? And can I tell you, if you are a follower of Christ, Jesus has given you a mission field. And we're going to see that in just a second. But you're going to find it in your workplace. You're going to find it in your home. You're going to find it in your family. You're going to find it uh, on the teams that you're in, in your workplace. You're going to find it at the grocery store. You're going to find it in the people that serve you your meals when you go out. To how you treat them and even invite them into this house. I love one of the greatest stories of life change at New Life Church. Our worship team goes to, to tacos every single week after their rehearsal on Wednesday nights. And, and they, they love their server that's there, and, and she loves them. And, and, man, they invited her church, and she came to church. And, man, she was, I don't know how long ago, but she was baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus a few months later. Can we give an amen for that? And not only that, not only that, but, but her husband, and, I, and forgive me if I didn't have permission to share this here. I'm not going to name names. But her husband came with her, experienced the power of the Holy Spirit and God, the forgiveness of God. And God spoke to him. And, and we have this thing called response time at the end of service where we don't just hear a great message, but we respond to who Jesus is and to what Jesus has said. And this man had the courage and the audacity, the bravery to, to be spoken to by God and to walk up to this cross and say, Jesus, man, I am an alcoholic. I struggle with alcohol. It's taking over my life. It's taking over my marriage. It's, it's, it's affecting every part of my life. And I'm going to nail that to the cross. I'm going to crucify it and let it die. And I'm going to receive your life. That man did that in this service. And he hasn't drank alcohol in over 40 days. That's the transformation of Jesus. That's the church of Jesus Christ. I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Is hell, hell prevailing in your life? Get involved in the church. Be a part of the church. Be in the church. So how, how are we going to do this? If, if, if no one comes unless we're going out there inviting people, how can we be mission-minded? I'm going to show you. The first thing we've got to do is we've got to be people of prayer. It starts with prayer. We've got we to gotta win the battle in the spiritual before we're ever going to win it this way. Let me show you in Scripture. 2 Corinthians says it this way. 
It says, in their case, meaning the people who do not know God, they're unbelievers, they haven't given their life to Christ. In their case, the God of this world, that Satan, that's our enemy, the enemy of humanity's soul, he's been given a timeline, a short period of time where he is the little g God of this world. And he's wreaking havoc. Everywhere you see death, destruction, stealing, killing, manipulating, lying, he's leading the charge. That's his language. The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers, the people that don't know God. And so listen to me for just a second. Instead of going out into your workplace and, and maybe to your kids or their, your kids' friends, instead of going out there and saying, man, you, you're, you're nothing like Jesus. You're a scumbag, man. you got to get it together. Maybe you should see through the spiritual eyes of Jesus that they are blinded to even know who he is and what he can do for their life. That they can become a son of God, a, a, a child of God, just like you and me but they're blinded. So spiritually speaking, we pray that that God would open their blind eyes, that the Spirit of God would draw them into a place where they can be known by other believers, that they can feel loved and encouraged, that they they don't have to have it all together. They they can come and experience a life-changing, powerful God and be saved. We win this war in the spiritual, and they will keep The God of this world is keeping them from seeing the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. He's trying to keep people dead when God wants to bring them back to life. Second thing we've got to do is we've got to serve. We've got to serve. Again, we can't just be sidelined. We've got to get into the game. We've got to get into the mission. We've got to say, Jesus, I understand your mission. Your mission is to build your church and to not let the gates of hell prevail against it. You came to seek and to save the lost. We need more people in this church and in every church. Why? Because more people need to be saved. More people need to get eternally settled, that need to receive Christ as their Savior and go to heaven, paradise, with us. And so we've got to serve to this effort. Here's the scripture. Jesus, this is, this is what he said, for even the son of man, that's Jesus, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. This is the heart of Jesus. This is the heartbeat of God, that he would leave his kingdom and, and come to earth to serve you and me. And we mimic this. And he gave his life as a ransom for many. He gave his life as a ransom for many. I love that word ransom. The payment of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. He ransomed us from death and destruction. And he gave us a new life. By what? By coming to serve. And so we got to take on his nature, his thought process. The next one we've got to do is we got to give. We got to give generously. We got to be a part of fueling God's work on the kingdom. And here's why we're the only entity on planet Earth that actually has the mission to take people from this earth to heaven. Our schools don't do that. They can, they can try. But it wasn't ordained by God. I will build my church. So let, watch this, watch this, watch this. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. That's pretty strong language. Like in this world, in our context, man, it's, it's all about me, 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 I, 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 I. I'm going to get what I want. I'm going to build that house. I'm going to have that boat. Man, I'm going to go out on the lake and have fun my, with my friends. I'm going to do all this. And then we're going to lead, we're, we're going to end up in life, and we're going to realize that we missed out on the greatness and the power and the purpose of God. So we got to deny ourselves. Deny ourselves like Jesus did. He left his throne in heaven to become one of us. I can't think of a more humiliating thing that you're, you're the Lord of lords. You're, you're, you're the almighty God. And then you're going to come and be with the ones that you created. But that's how much he loved us. He denied himself. He took up his cross. And we're going to do the same. And we're going to follow Jesus. So think about what Jesus did. When he took up his cross, he gave his life for us. Hey, Christian, hey, follower of Jesus, are you on an active duty? Are you denying yourself, taking up your cross for the benefit of others? Or are you just making this Christian life all about you? 
Are you making the, the, this life in general just all about you? Because I promise you, this is the greatest life imaginable. And it will lead to freedom and purpose like you've never seen before. He goes on and he says, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will actually find it. So in that serving, in that denying of yourself, you actually find fulfillment beyond your wildest dreams. Why? Because you're wired to be this. You're wired from Jesus to be these kinds of people. Can I get an amen? And those of you who serve on the dream team, you know this. Like you've experienced this firsthand. That you've denied yourself. You said, man, I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to serve the purposes of God. I'm going to help to build the church of God. I'm going to come early and, and set up kids ministry. Man, I'm going to get involved in, in maybe the parking team. And you think it doesn't matter? It matters. Every single thing that we do as a church matters to God. And it matters to take people to heaven with us. Can I get an amen? Last week I had the opportunity to not teach you kids, but to teach our third through fifth graders. And man, I, I want to continue to be able to do stuff like that, where I can go in and out of teaching kids. And, and man, you know what, you know what doesn't, doesn't matter? It doesn't matter necessarily all the time that I'm gifted or passionate or I know how to do it. Do you know what matters? I have the willingness. I have the willingness to say, God, whatever it is, send me. I'll go and I'll do it. Why? Because I'm a follower of God. I'm a follower of Christ. He says, you must each decide, this is about financial giving now, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. Again, think about ways in which you give. And, and, and here's the question. Will what you give and what you give to, will it end up in eternity? Because there's a lot of great causes out there. There's a lot of great causes. And honestly, I'm not going to tell you not to give to some of those causes, but you absolutely should consider and ask God if and when you should give to that which takes people to heaven. But don't give it reluctantly or in response to, ple- to pressure. Here's how we put it. You ask God and you be faithful to what he tells you to do. For God loves a person who gives it cheerfully. The people of New Life Church, man, I can't even tell you the irrational generosity that you've portrayed over the years where we have been able to be a blessing to so many people because of your faithfulness in bringing the tithe to your faithfulness in bringing above and beyond the tithe to be able to benefit people across the street and around the world where we get to serve and, and, and do things like sandbags for people who are losing their houses a couple years ago on, on the lake. We get to do things right now, like in the past week, we sent over $10,000 directly to churches in, in Moldova to be able to be pre- prepared for the onslaught of refugees that are coming into their country. You're making a difference, providing Bibles for the kids. You're, you're making a difference by, by providing food. For, can you imagine your families being displaced like they are? And God has called us to be his hands and his feet, to be light in the darkness. And we have the opportunity. I I would even say it this way. We have the obligation to be a part of Jesus' mission, to fulfill what he's called us to do. And to do it, I can tell you this, I've never met a person who's begrudgingly given to God and regretted it. I've never met that person. So some of you need to consider that. And the fourth one is go. The first one is go. Jesus came and told his disciples, man, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Listen, I know some of you, again, I'm speaking to Christians. So if you're not a Christian or you're just checking this faith thing out, you might be like, man, this guy's super passionate and I am. You better believe it. And I'm not going to, you know, tone that down for anybody. But here's the deal. Some of you go into a workplace and you're like, man, my boss tells me I'm not supposed to talk about Jesus. My boss tells me I'm not supposed to, to talk about faith. Uh, maybe you're in the school system and they're like, no, 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 faith. Government, no, 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 faith and, and you know, separation of church and state. Can I say that's just... <laughs> All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. 
And Jesus said that he's given to you and to me, followers of Christ, he's given to you and I the keys to the kingdom of God, which means that he has given you the authority to open spiritual doors for others. Can I tell you, stop letting the world, stop letting Satan tell you what you can and cannot do. We are to rescue people and bring them to Jesus so they can spend eternity in paradise with him. Let's go. So that's what he says. Jesus says, therefore, go and make disciples. Where? Of all the nations, of all different people groups and backgrounds and and nations and, and races, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples. For some of you, I can't wait for next week. I got some all sorts of crazy shenanigans planned for next week. So you're going to want to be here and you're going to want to bring some friends because if you've seen some of my shenanigans in the past, it's going to get real next week. It's just a side note. But for some of you, man, you're Christians and, and man, you've been, you've been coming to church for, for decades and man, but you've never actually taken a step to teach other people what you know. Again, you're still in an active duty. Because some of you, man, you, you see the pastor as the guy who's supposed to do that. I'm the dude with the food and I'm just supposed to, to feed everybody. But Jesus said we're all to be that. We are all to go and to make disciples. If you're a disciple of Christ, your role, your job, your calling, your mission, your operation is to teach these new disciples to obey all, not your commands, his commands that he's given to you. And to be sure, he's with you. The, the one who has all the authority on heaven and earth, he is with you even to the end of the age. He goes with you. And I don't know about you, but that, that, that make, makes me feel a whole lot better. Like, like, I don't know if you know this, and this is just a, a secret, and i got to stop preaching because we got to bring a special guest up here, and we're running out of time, but I'm really amped up. And uh, every time I get up on stage or every time I, I, I share Jesus with people, I, I take, I, I, this is just kind of a, a, a thing that I do, I just take a step, and I say, God, I'm stepping into your authority. I'm stepping into your purpose. I'm stepping into, and I don't want to take that step without you going with me. And here's why. Let me show you. Acts 1 verse 8, it says, Jesus says, says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Listen, if you don't go with the Holy Spirit of God, your mission and your your action, your, your efforts will go nowhere and they will lack power. You need the Holy Spirit of God. And he says, then, when you have the Holy Spirit come on you and in you, you then will be my witnesses. And I love this world. World. I love this world too. But I love this word. And honestly, a couple years ago, this really shifted my, 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 my thought process because I think a lot of churches have gotten it wrong, we've taught this wrong, where we're just to go out in the world and say, man, the world sucks and the world is terrible and man, you're, you're a cusser, sinner, no good, whatever, and man, you drink too much and man, you watch pornography and, and, and man, you cheated on your spouse and, and we're just, we're, we're literally launching spiritual biblical grenades at people, just spiritual biblical machine gun, just wiping people out. But let me tell you the difference between that person and what a witness does. A witness shares with people the goodness of God. It, it's, listen to me. It's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. And we're to share, we're to be witnesses of who God is and, and what he's about and how much he loves us, that he, he was willing to send his son to die for us and his son was willing to accept that mission for us and, and he did it. There was no one else like him. And we can tell of the story of what God is doing in our lives. And where are we to do this? We're to do this in Jerusalem. Where's that? Kalamazoo in the Portage region. We're to do that right here where our church is located. We're to do that in all Judea. That's our state through our partnership with planting churches through ARC around the state and our nation in Samaria and to the ends of the earth, our world. 
And today I want to invite with you up to the stage and we're going to share a short video of what we do to partner with an organization called One Child to make sure that we are sharing the gospel with churches and with kids in the country of Honduras. And I can promise you, you are making a difference to this end. Before going to Honduras, I always thought of child sponsorships as kind of those commercials that you see on TV for those kids that, you know, really look like they need food, but it also kind of reminds you of the Sarah McLaughlin infomercials. So I never really thought that your money actually went to those kids. And so I always kind of thought of it like more scammy than anything. I began to sponsor Oscar because I heard of other people sponsoring children and I was given the opportunity to go to the Honduras trip and on that trip I was able to meet my um, sponsor child Oscar and his family. So going to Honduras I was able to see sponsors actually meet their kid and I got to see that the money that they provide to their sponsor kid actually goes to their kid and actually helps them. and. It was amazing to see the connection between the sponsor and their child while I was there. And I was like, wow, wow, like this, this sponsorship is real. It's not those infomercials that you see on TV. We're really impacting their lives. Um, I was surprised by the impact that the sponsorship had on his family um, because it's such a small amount that we give every month and that amount goes to help them so much. And his mom was so grateful for it. She um, explained to me that she prayed every single day that he would have a sponsor. And um, she, um, she got emotional about it. And she just kept saying repeatedly, thank you, thank you for sponsoring my child because without this, he probably wouldn't graduate and he might end up in a gang. So something so small meant so much to them. So Erica sponsored Child So Ad. Um, we walked into her living room and they were chit-chatting and Erica was like, have you been getting my letters? And so Ed goes, oh yeah, just a second. And she ran into her room and came back with a stack of Erica's letters and she had kept them all and she said that she rereads them like every week and she just anticipates the next letter. And that is like such a, wonderful connection that they've made. Oscar's mom was such a blessing to my daughter and I. She used her earnings for the day to buy us fruit. And she could have just bought us one piece of fruit, but um, she bought us three. And we were so surprised and so grateful that she took her own money to do that. And for her, that was a lot. And it meant so much to us. So as Pastor Dan has always said, um, there are people that want to go on a mission trip and that are called by God to go on the mission trip, those that are to give to a mission trip, and those who pray for those who are going on the mission trip. And if you, I would say if you do have a sponsored child, that it is the most probably amazing thing that you could do to go and meet them. These kids are so excited to meet their sponsors. It was an honor to meet Oscar's mom. Um, and even though there's a language barrier, there was this unspoken bond between the two of us, and it was such a strong bond that only God could have created it. We connected immediately, and it was as if we had known each other forever. And we both know struggles. We both, you know, know exactly what it is to struggle and to work so hard for your children to only want the best for them. And so we both held each other's hands and just looking into each other's eyes. We knew exactly what we were thinking, and it was all about Oscar and what we want for him and what we hope for him. I know I still like was going back and forth about sponsorship while I was there, and then we went to a new center. And I got to meet this little girl, and she had lost her mom the year before. And I left there being like, I need to sponsor that little girl. Because she just, what we can do for them is more than you'll ever know and ever realize. So I just think it's really important 
that all these kiddos can find sponsors. I want to welcome one child's representative, Brandon Ramey, with us. You've been with us before. And just briefly, we want to be able to share with you and what, what sponsoring a kid is all about. What, what does it mean? We, we partner with a local church in Honduras that, that provides so many of these things, that the sponsorship, the, the, the teaching of God's word, the meals, and all that type of thing. And it's, it's church-based. And we call it a hope center because so many of these kids, they need hope. So can you explain to, to those of us who maybe not sponsor a kid or, you know, what, what does that mean and how do we do that? Yeah, well, first off, thank you guys so much for just even allowing me to be here. I think it's an amazing partnership that we have and super appreciative of your heart and yeah. your passion and the church's passion. So if you're not familiar with who we are, we're one child and one child, what we do is we work with kids internationally. We work through uh, hope centers, like you said, the local church, and we reach kids in really difficult places. So we work in 14 countries all over the world. And what that looks like is when we work through the local church, we do call it a hope center because we want that church to be a city on a hill. Mm -hmm. And we want Jesus to be the hope of every child's story. We want them to find hope in Christ. Right. And when they come to the hope center, uh, that's where they get the things that you saw on video, the benefit of a good meal, they get nutrition, they get education, they get support, they get medical treatments. Uh, they are surrounded by a group of people who we call child champions, who actually anybody who sponsors and supports kids is a child champion. And they care for the kids, they watch over the kids, and they listen to the kids. So for us, it's not just about engaging with them through nutrition and educational support. It's also listening to making sure things are being developed in their life. Mm -hmm. Because the tangible things like the nutrition, education, those are great. But we hope that those tangible things lead to something bigger. And we call, in a framework of words, those things as hope and dreams. Because mm -hmm. we want a child to hope that tomorrow can be better, to yeah. dream about who they can become. Absolutely. Because if you're a child in poverty, really what's going on in your mind, the whisper and the wind in your ear is always that you'll never be enough. Like, this is life. This is all it's going to be. This is all it's probably ever going to be. And as you begin to think and believe that, you eventually become that. Right. And so what sponsorship does, what a child development program does, when you have access to opportunity you never would have had otherwise, you begin to hope that tomorrow can be different, and you begin to dream about who you can become. And so that's, the, that's our hope, that's our aim, is we want for kids, when they get access, when they come to a place, when they come to the church, when they hear about Jesus, when they hear about God's purpose in their life, his plan for their life, when they receive love from child champions and people who encourage them, who watch over them, when they're eating that good meal, when they're getting those medical uh, updates, when they're getting educational support, we want all of that to create in their life the ability to believe there is more. Yeah, absolutely. There's more for me. There's more for my family. There's more for my community. And it's true, right? You hope that for your kids. Now, the question is like, well, do they become that? And the question is, well, do your kids? But it's opportunity. Right. The opportunity to become is far more powerful than what actually, actually, whether they become the doctor or the teacher. It's the path that they have, the opportunity to become that, where otherwise they never had that otherwise. Absolutely. And I love the fact that we, we have the opportunity to not only take these kids and sponsor them, but also to go and, and meet them. That this is, you know, even, even one of the best things I love about this is the relationships that are built. I love that, 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 that Erica sponsored the little girl and then the girl literally, when she was there, she ran and got all the letters and she rereads them. And, and this isn't like, this, this, they don't, they love this. And it's about relationship. And I love that our daughters, we, we sponsored a couple kids Two, I think two or three years ago when we started this partnership and our daughters have helped write these letters. They're, they're almost, it's almost as if they're, they're, they're sis, they have a sister and a brother in Honduras. And honestly, our hope as a family is that someday when our girls are old enough, they can actually go with us to that. And that actually happened with our sister-in-law, our, 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 one of our pastors here, Jessica Sims. Her sons, who are now in middle school, went on the last trip. And so they've gotten the opportunity to not only sponsor the, the, these kids and to write letters to him, but then they went to this mission trip, on this mission trip, and got to meet him and play with him and play soccer and football. Teach him how to play real football, right? American football, not that whatever soccer stuff. I'm looking at Jeff Diebel. He played soccer. But, man, this is incredible. And here's, here's what I know. When you, when you give, when you participate in being generous to someone else, 
you're not only making a difference in your life, but your life is being changed. And, and we know this. We've been in, in ministry for a long time, and especially on, in foreign missions. Man, when you have the opportunity to go, you'll not only see the hope and the, the, the difference that you're making in those kids' lives and in those people's lives, but I promise you when you go, the person that will be changed and transformed the most is you. You'll be transformed the most. And so I wanna, we want to encourage you to, to maybe go out into the lobby today. We have a, a setup in, in the lobby where there will be all sorts of kids that you can take a look at and, and read some of their profiles. And we can, our, our, our missions team, the team that was just in Honduras just a few short weeks ago, a bunch of them are going to be out there. So you can even ask questions of them of what it was like and to meet the kids and be able to tell the stories. They'll probably be even, even tell you about the specific kids that are on those, those cards because it's not just a kid on a card. It's real life. It's a real kid that we have an opportunity to bless and make a difference in the life of. Yeah, and I think that's the beautiful part. So, you know, as you go out in the lobby and when you go peruse those profiles, um, you're, you're going to see faces, you're going to see names, you're going to see birthdays, you're going to see all these things. And so whatever, so this is Emily, and Emily's five. And so when you pick up that profile, it's going to have a little bit about her story, kind of her background, her dreams, like who she wants to become. And then it's got this part, which is perforated. And this is the information part that you get to fill out. And uh, so people off, you know, the, the, what's the cost? So the cost of sponsorship is $39 a month. There is an option for 45. That extra six goes towards our unsponsored children. So once a child is registered, we never remove them from the program. We always keep them in so we can find a sponsor for them who can come alongside them and support their journey. And, and the beautiful part about this is like, that's the cost, right? And that cost helps cover everything that I've already mentioned. But the power is everything you just talked about. It's the relationship. Yep. It's what you saw on the video. It's the story of Jessica and her kids and the ability to sit down at a table as you pray for your meal, to be reminded of praying for the meal of Emily. Mm -hmm. When you go and you're praying for your kids at night, you're praying for Emily as well. When you're thinking about your day, you're thinking about her day. You're incorporating another person into your journey. And there's probably nothing more gospel-centered and gospel-like than that. Right. Because Emily is never going to repay us. Absolutely. And, and we're never going to be able to repay Jesus. And yet he entered into our story. He wove his story into our story. And that's the power of sponsorship. The power of sponsorship is the ability to weave our story into the life of somebody else so you can see everything you just saw on that screen. Joy, peace, hope, the ability to connect to a person. So this isn't just a profile. It's not just a picture on a fridge. It's actual child that you get to go see. And all these kids, the beautiful part, come from the same area. So you can go and take these trips. So you can invest in this community. So you can invest in these lives, not just in a year, but in five years, in 10 years. There's a long-term vision attached to these short-term mission trips. And so my encouragement to you is always to pray and ask God. And I, I said this during our Dream Team rally. I'm a little biased maybe, but I just every, <laughs> every time I read scripture, I just always see Jesus on the side of the widow, the children, and the orphan. And so I just believe with all my heart that we are called to invest in the lives of others, specifically kids. In fact, you, you may or may not know this, but most people come to Christ in their adolescence. Yeah, absolutely. Children. Yep. That's when most people come to know the Lord. And so we have the opportunity to reach kids in a place, in an environment. And here's the thing. Kids are not... Emily is not the object of our benevolence. She's just not the recipient of our generosity. She is actually on mission with, with us, us to be a change agent in her community. And that's the beautiful part. When we reach a person like Emily, when we reach her life, she has the ability now to change her community, her family. And so she is a co-laborer. She is on mission with us. She is an agent of change in the world that she lives in. And we get to come alongside her, support her, pray for her, dream with her, and just continue to support and encourage her all along the way. And I think that's one of the most powerful things about sponsorship, is that we are equipping children in Christ to change their community like you guys are changing this community. Absolutely. That's awesome. That is awesome. So, here, so here's the thing. As a, as a leader, as, a, as a, a spiritual leader, as your pastor, I don't, I don't want to just teach the scriptures and tell you what Jesus said to do. I want to give you the opportunity to do it. Because it's not just about what we know and what we hear and what we sit in church and soak up. And, and, and we want to live a life of fulfillment. 
That we have this phrase that, that, that's on our wall, that the local church mobilized is the hope of the world. That means we're going to take what Jesus says, and we're not just going to hear it as if they're these great platitudes and ideas. We're going to live it out. We're going to do it. We're going to be, listen to this, we're going to be hope dealers. We're going to be hope dealers. And so I want you to consider, again, today, pray about it as we, as we close this service and we go into another worship song and we, we ask God, man, what would you have us to do? Man, are we going to pray or are we going to serve? Are we going get, to get involved? Are we going to give and go? Because that's what God has called us to do. That's what Jesus has called us to do. And you said how, he, how Jesus references the, the orphan and the widow. There's, there's no other group of people than the orphan and the widow that are more helpless and alone in their journey of life. That, that, that they, they literally have no one. And we have the opportunity that God says that he is father to the fatherless. And we get to welcome them home and being a part of our family. So let's thank Brandon one more time. And in this moment, I would invite the, the worship team to come out. And, and we're going to go into response time in just a moment. And we're going to ask these two questions, right? The question is, God, what did you say today? What, what, did, you, what did you speak to me? And so each one of us is going to ask that personally. We're going to say, God, what did you speak to me directly? And then the question is, what are we going to do with it? And and so for some of us, it it might be, man, we're going to get into the game. We're going to start praying for the lost. We're going to bring people to church to, to, to help build his house and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. We're going to pray that the lost, that their, their eyes would be open to the glory of the gospel, that they don't have to pay for their own sins, that Jesus did that for them. That we're going to step into the game. We're not going to be, you know, inactive and in inactive duty. No, 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 no. We're going to be on active duty. Why? Because Jesus did it himself. He came to serve and not to be served. We're going to deny ourselves, pick up our cross for the benefit of someone else. We're going to give extraordinarily, irrationally to the move of God on the earth. And we're going to go with the good news of Jesus Christ that they can receive eternal life. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes for just a moment. And if, if you're in the room today or maybe watching online, and, and maybe you're one of those people that maybe you haven't stepped into a relationship with Christ, with God himself. Or maybe you've, maybe you've run from him. From him. You, you did know him and you've kind of gone your own way. And I got to tell you that God the Father wants to receive you back home. Here's how that happens. Very simply... From your heart to God's, you realize that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. That that there's no one perfect. No, not not one. Not one of us. And so if you're in the room or watching online today and you want to receive salvation from the Savior, on a count of three, I want you to take a step of faith. So if you're in the room, here's how you'll know. We're watching online. Here's how you know if God is messing with you. The Bible says that he stands at the door of our hearts and he knocks. And so if you're sensing his presence, if you're sensing his urging, respond to him. Open the door of your life and let him in. And to mark this moment in a step of faith, on a count of three, I'm going to ask you to to raise your hand with with no one looking around, all eyes closed and every head bowed. Before God, basically saying, here I am, God. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Church Online, you can click the link and say, I will receive Jesus today. One, two, three. Shoot your hand up in the air and hold it up. He sees you and he loves you. And he's forgiving you in this moment welcoming you home. You can slip your hands down. Now from your heart directly to God, I'll help you the words. It says if we confess in our heart that Jesus is Lord, he will be faithful and just to forgive us. 
So in this moment, from your heart to God, you simply say, Jesus, I am a sinner in need of a savior. Rescue me, save me, forgive me. In this moment, I make you Lord, that you are God, you are sovereign, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and there is no way that is above your way. I turn from my way, and I turn to you. Now, Jesus, in this moment, I pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. Come upon me, come inside of me, and live inside of me. That I could overcome sin and death and the grave and live out a purpose-driven life. I receive you in this moment, and I give you everything I am and everything I'll ever be. In Jesus' name, amen.